Welcome to this presentation of Kubernetes as a Service on vCloud Director using the Container Service Extension and VCD CLI. Before we start, it's important to understand the container services available to cloud provider partners. Pivotal Container Service, or PKS for short, is VMware's strategic, fully supported container service offering. It was released in December 2017 and is VMware's commercial product, available to providers offering dedicated vCenter environments to their customers. The Container Service Extension, or CSE for short, is VMware's open source container solution for providers running vCloud Director. Version 1 was released with vCloud Director 9.1 in March 2018, and while the CSE service is supported by Global Support Services, GSS, the Kubernetes service itself is not. As PKS is our strategic direction for container services, work is underway to bring it to vCloud Director, but, as there is also a dependency to support NSXT in order to do so, this is not a simple task. There'll be more announcements about this over time. OK, with the positioning of our different services out of the way, let's look at the objectives of this presentation and the way CSE enables our cloud provider partners. We want to enable cloud provider partners to offer Kubernetes as a service on top of vCloud Director. We want to enable the tenants to request IaaS capacity pre-configured with the Kubernetes environment. We want to enable tenant developers to control that Kubernetes environment using native tools and we want to enable remote access to both the infrastructure and Kubernetes networks. Let's take a look at the service from the 10,000 foot view. First, we'll take a look at the service from the developer's point of view. Stereotypically, the developer is only concerned with the code on his laptop development environment, and the further towards the cloud it gets, the less the developer cares about the detail, shown here with the fade. What is real to the developer is the ability to interact with the development and production environments in the same way, ideally with the same tools, such as Kube Control, shown here. You could think of the developer view as a scale from the real through to imaginary, the further towards the cloud you go. Imaginary is a little harsh. Let's just call the cloud end somebody else's problem. Let's look at that same picture from the somebody else's point of view now, the infrastructure architects. For an architect familiar with VCD, the view is virtual machines connected to org VDC networks with edge gateways inside layers of organization and provider virtual data centers. As this is VCD, groups of VMs which form a logical application are contained in a vApp. In the Kubernetes as a service model, these VMs are pre-built with three layers, an operating system running a container engine, which in turn runs the containers themselves. A group of VMs together providing capacity to a Kubernetes managed application are called a cluster not to be confused with the vSphere cluster below all this. The operating system layer is typically a lightweight Linux-based OS and, out of the box, CSE ships with configurations for an Ubuntu and a Photon OS template. The container engine, or runtime, is an application which runs on the underlying OS and is typically something like Rocket from CoreOS or, in our case, Docker. The third layer is where the applications which our developers care about live. They're split into two groups, the Kubernetes management components themselves and the actual application components in containers, which in Kubernetes are collectively known as a pod. This works well in our infrastructure architects view, right up to the point where we let the developers loose on the platform. OK, now let's start to look at things from the application view. From the end user point of view, all of this is leading to some application which they find useful, or in this example, one that sells socks. Behind the scenes, Kubernetes sees the application as a pod, or a collection of containers, each with a particular role. Let's start to look at how the developer and infrastructure views come together. Internally, the containers which make up the pod use an overlay software-defined network to talk to each other. The container service extension currently uses Weave, which integrates well with Docker. VMware's PKS service uses NSXT in the same role, but for now, we run Weave. NSXV is still in the picture, as we'll see shortly. Kubernetes defines an application's components using the concept of a deployment, which defines how many of each type and what versions of each container there need to be. During a deployment, the container images are downloaded from a network reachable repository, started, and connected to the container overlay network. Many of the components only need to communicate with each other, but so users can access the applications, some may need external access. In our example, it's the front-end node, the red one. With our infrastructure hat on, containers which need external access have to be connected to an org VDC network so that they can be reached from the outside world. Logically, the end result looks like this. Let's look at that last picture, but this time from the infrastructure view. Here we have our three Kubernetes VMs ready to host containers, 
Kubernetes calls them nodes, it used to call them minions, and CSE gives them randomized names because they're cattle, not pets. As they're regular VMs, when VCD provisions them, they'll be assigned IP addresses on the org VDC network they're connected to. The end game is still our developer's application, which needs all those containers defined in the Kubernetes deployment. In order to manage the deployment and to give the developers a control point to issue commands to, CSE deploys an additional master node into the cluster, which runs the Kubernetes management components. This master is in addition to the number of nodes which were requested for the cluster. As we saw in the last slide, as the Kubernetes master runs through the deployment, the containers which make up the application are each downloaded and started across the Docker runtime engines on the nodes in the Kubernetes cluster. Together, these containers make up a Kubernetes pod, in this case within a namespace called SockShop. Some public Kubernetes service use the namespace as a tenant separator on a shared Kubernetes platform, but running Kubernetes on top of vCloud Director brings all of the underlying tenancy and separation of traditional IaaS to the container service. As we saw earlier, the Docker hosts run a container overlay network, which our newly deployed containers are connected to. In the last slide, we showed the red front-end node logically connected to the org VDC network. In order to accomplish this, Kubernetes uses a concept called a node port. A node port is part of a Kubernetes service definition and defines a network port number which behaves like a NAT between a port on each node's external address, the 10.142 addresses in our case, and the front-end container on whichever node it is running. In this example, connecting to port 30001 on any of our VMs will NAT to the front-end container. There were a couple of layers of networking going on in that last slide, and we know that there are still more in the vSphere layers below, so let's take a closer look at them. As you can see, the org VDC network and the container overlay networks use different address ranges. They don't have to, as each layer is encapsulated within the layer below, but it's simpler to understand if they do. Let's see what all that encapsulation really looks like. We'll keep the original picture up here in the corner as a reminder of what we're trying to achieve. This was the view we saw on the previous slide, with the containers connected to the Weave overlay network and the VMs connected to the Org VDC network. Let's remove the networks for now and then build up the layers one by one. Firstly, within each node, the Docker Engine and Weave Agent plugin together create a local Weave network. The containers running on each node are connected to their local Weave network. The Weave agent on each node encapsulates the container traffic using VXLAN encapsulation, ready for transmission between the nodes. The node VMs are connected to ports on DV switch port groups on their respective ESXi hosts. As the ESXi hosts are running NSX, those port groups are NSX VXLAN backed, and VMs on that org VDC network connect to VMs on other ESX hosts through their hosts NSX VXLAN tunnel endpoint, or VTEP. Each host's NSX encapsulated traffic is then uplinked to the NSX transport VLAN on the physical network underlay through the host's physical NIC. So, from top to bottom, we have the containers connected to the container overlay network using Weave's native VXLAN encapsulation. That traffic is, in turn, transmitted between the node VMs connected to org VDC networks using NSX controlled VXLAN encapsulation, which is in turn, transmitted across the physical network using native Ethernet encapsulation, typically with 802.1Q VLAN tagging or trunking. Phew. Here's the vApp view from the VCD HTML5 tenant user interface. You can see the name of our vApp, which is also the name we give the Kubernetes cluster when we create it, as well as the org VDC the vApp is provisioned into. And here's our Kubernetes cluster from the VCD vApps virtual machine view. Here's the master VM, which you can tell from its MSTR VM name prefix. And here are the node VMs, which you can tell from their node VM name prefix. Here you can see the org VDC network the VMs are connected to. And to tie things neatly together, here's the VCD network view. Here's the network we saw the VMs connected to in the previous slide and here is that 10142 address range we saw the VMs allocated from in the networking slides. Let's now take a look under the hood at how the container service extension fits into a vCloud Director installation. Let's take a look at the installation of the container service extension from the service provider's point of view. Here's a simplified view of a vCloud Director installation. We have a resource vCenter, vCD cells, a Postgres database and RabbitMQ. We also have an NFS share, but that doesn't really play much of a part in this. Installing CSE requires the deployment of a Python-based service onto a host in the vCloud Director management platform, 
we've used a standalone Photon or SVM in this example. If you're deploying to an environment with an existing RabbitMQ, you use that. But if not, such as a lab environment or a production deployment without any previous API extensibility, you'll have to deploy RabbitMQ as well. Details of how to deploy and configure RabbitMQ can be found on the vCloud Director documentation site and the Container Service Extension GitHub page. In most cases, you'll want to deploy a new VM to host the Container Service Extension. Let's take a look at the steps the tenant administrator, or the service provider on their behalf, needs to take to interact with the Kubernetes as a Service capability of vCloud Director. The service is presented as an extension to the vCloud Director API. The tenant administrator, or service provider, controls the service using the VCD CLI tool, extended with the Container Service Extension add-on, both of which are Python-based. They require a suitable Python-equipped host which has access to the vCloud Director's public API endpoint. We'll see more of how that works later on. Finally, let's take a look at the tenant developer. In order to use the service, they'll need... Well, as we said way back on slide 3, they should be able to use their native development tools. After all, to the developer, this is just Kubernetes, except on a resource platform which is under the control of the tenant administrator or service provider. They will of course need those native tools, such as, in this case, kubectl, and of course, network connectivity to the OrgVDC network where their Kubernetes cluster is connected. Let's take a quick look at the installation process, at least from a high level. If you need to install RabbitMQ, use the VCD installation docs and the container service extension installation docs on the GitHub page, which is shown at the end of this video. This isn't a substitute for reading the docs, but here are a few key takeaways from our experience doing this over and over again during development. Step 1 on the host VM you plan to run the container service extension on is to install the package using pip. We need Python 3, so to be sure, we'll use pip3. This is standard Python stuff, so you can install to the user directory if you created a CSE user, or to the system site packages, or into a virtual environment. Next, as we'll need a config file to feed back into the actual extension service setup, we use CSE to generate a sample config file. Here, we're redirecting the output to a file we'll then edit and use for the installation. Once we've edited the sample config file to suit our purposes, we can have CSE install the extension, configure it, and register it with VCD. This process downloads the Ubuntu and Photon node templates, deploys them as temporary VMs, customizes the temporary VMs with the necessary packages before uploading them to the VCD catalog so that they can be deployed into Kubernetes clusters later. And then, in step 4, we get CSE to validate the installation against the configuration in the YAML file. Here's the installation process as you'd see it from the CLI of the CSE host when you execute the CSE install command. Once the installation is started, CSE confirms the action and the config file it is using connects to VCD using the credentials in the file, checks that the organization where its catalog entry will be created exists, checks that the org VDC where it will deploy the temporary VMs exists, creates the new catalog to hold the template VMs, checks that it was created successfully. Next, we download the template images from the source repository we specified in the configuration.yaml file and upload it into VCD, as you can see here. This takes some time to complete, but once it does, we check that VCD has the vApp template OVA, then deploy a temporary vApp from the template we uploaded, as you can see here. At this point, we wait for the temporary vApp VM to complete deployment and start. We can tell it's running when we can see its IP address. Once the temporary VM is running, as you can see here, we're ready for the next stage. Using the vSphere API, we connect to the temporary VM and customize it with the Kubernetes, Docker, Weave, and other packages we need. This can take some time, and unfortunately, CSE has limited visibility of the process within the VM, so you just have to watch the dots. When the customization process completes, the resulting VM is ready to be captured as the final template vApp we'll use for the actual Kubernetes cluster deployments. First, we check that the vApp is available from VCD, then we start the capture process. We shut down the vApp through VCD, which again takes a little time. Then we use the VCD API to capture the VM we customized to a template vApp, as you can see in the catalog here. When the API call to create the vApp template returns, we check that the OVA is available in the VCD catalog. And finally, alert the user that the process is complete and that the next stage is to run CSE so that it's ready to receive API calls. In this example, we're only creating the Photon OS template, 
but if we were also creating the Ubuntu one, you'd see parts of the previous workflow repeat for each template. Once the installation phase is complete, we can check that the extension registered correctly. We do this through the VCD CLI with these commands. Finally, we start the CSE Python process. The process needs to run continually to listen out for CSE API calls on the AMQP bus through RabbitMQ. In the last slide, we saw how CSE can simply be run from the command line with the CSE run and the name of its configuration file, but that blocks the SSH session to the host. It could instead be run from a TMUX session, which could then be detached to run in the background. For a more robust operation, the CSE GitHub page has an example system control file, which can be used to start CSE as a service using the systemctl command shown here. The installation on the tenant administration host is pretty simple. First, the container service extension package is installed, once again using pip3. This also installs the VCD CLI and PI vCloud packages which CSE depends upon. Next, the VCD CLI profiles.yaml file needs editing to add the container service extension. And that's it, ready for operation, which we'll see in the next section. OK, with all the pieces in place, let's see how the container service extension works in practice. On the tenant admin host, or the service provider's equivalent, CSE is controlled through the VCD CLI. As we saw on the installation slides, CSE is added as an extension to VCD CLI and is presented as a family of commands within it. Typing VCD CSE will show a list of command options. These can change as new options are added, so you might see a different list of those shown here. One key command is cluster config. This outputs the kubectl config file for the named cluster. Here's an example of the output, which would typically be piped to a file so that it can be sent to the developer or team who will be using that cluster. Let's take a look at the data flows behind one of those commands. The tenant administrator requests a new cluster, in this case called CSE 0.4.0-test, because we like snappy names, with three nodes to be placed on the OVDC network rooted internet network. Through the VCD CLI tool, an API call is made to the VCD endpoint. The receiving cell passes the request to the CSE queue using AMQP and RabbitMQ. The CSE service host picks up the request from the queue for processing. The CSE service host uses the VCD API to request a new vApp with four copies of the requested node template VMs, one master and three nodes, in the correct organization VDC and org VDC network. Once the node VMs are ready, the vCenter API is used to run customization commands in the guest OSs to configure Kubernetes, Weave and the other components for this cluster. The CSE service host returns details of the executed commands or the resulting task to the queue. It's worth noting that some operations result in a VCD task being generated which runs asynchronously, allowing the notification step number 5 above to execute before the task or tasks 4A and 4B here complete. The details are collected from the message queue by the VCD cell and returned as a response to the original API call. Upon receipt of the response, the VCD CLI command completes. This presentation has only scratched the surface of the container service extension for vCloud Director. The CSE project is hosted on GitHub at this URL, where you'll find lots more information. Look out for a white paper on the VCAT SP website at vmware.com slash go slash vcat, and a series of blog posts on the container service extension at blogs.vmware.com slash vcat.